G'day mates and welcome back to part number two. Now I'll be doing a voiceover for this one because I had a cold for the, most of the actual recording and it is much easier to sort of explain and get some decent audio quality in here. Now what we're doing here, after we've salted in the last episode, uh, we've taken out, this is about a week and a half later, I've taken my skin out and I'm fleshing it. This is probably the most gory part of the entire job. You can see that the skin is nice and shiny all the way through. This was a particularly good skinning job by a person who skinned it. It wasn't actually me who did it. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of meat sort of along the back, center of the back line where I'm currently pulling it off. And uh, what you want to do is use a knife or some sort of fleshing tool to scrape off as much of this as possible. Now, you also want to get off the membrane. If you have a look, it's a little kitty cat. If you have a look down the bottom, you'll actually see a uh, cat has just come back. It's quite distracting. You'll see sort of at the bottom center of the screen, right where that cat's head was just for a second ago, um, little bits of membrane and, and stuff. It's quite smooth there and beautiful. It has that sort of blue color to it. Uh, but what we're looking at there is little bits of the membrane. We want to remove the membrane as much as possible. Uh, you can use a knife to actually cut and peel it back, and particularly good fleshing knives will actually be able to really scrape that back in one go. Uh, the membrane here is quite thin though, and for the most part, uh, my style of fleshing is to just get rid of all the fat and the meat uh, while actually leaving most of that membrane there, and I'll actually score that at a later date, and I'll show you how I do that. So actually removing all the fatty bits is the vital part. These large fatty chunks that I'm sort of seeing me throwing on the floor over there are actually going to rot and they will get quite rancid and horrible if you don't remove them at this step here. Um, if you don't get rid of them before the tanning, they uh, become quite difficult to remove after that and effectively will be blocking the tanning fluid or solution from soaking into the skin. So uh, what we do need to do is get as, um, as much of that off as possible. Little bits on the edge, you can sort of see on the left-hand side at the center there, there's a bit of a fat membrane there. Some of these bits right on the edge I will leave, simply because I'll be actually going along and cutting off the edge pieces, making the shape a little bit more ideal for how I want it. It is important to probably do this when it's a little bit wetter. I did soak this slightly after pulling it out. I gave it about maybe two or three hours, although if your skin is particularly dry, you may want to give it perhaps overnight and just soak it to rehydrate it after salting it. It makes it a hell of a lot easier when fleshing. I like to do this part when it's a little bit drier because I get a bit of grip with my hands. It's not quite as slippery, although when I'm doing a whole bunch of them at once, it can be a lot easier to just um, soak them all right through and then just scrape off the slime bits. When you are going to be cutting, the skin, it's pretty much important to just get the shape that you want. You can leave it however you want. I quite like a sort of a rough, a rough sort of a uh, animal shape with mine, but some people like to cut them into rectangles or squares or make them more of an oval sort of a shape. I kind of like to have that, that idea that this was at some point an animal. It sort of uh, keeps that respect in it for me, but you are completely free to do however you want with your skin. What I'm going to be doing now is just fast forwarding on to give you sort of the entire fleshing process and, and watch me actually do it. You'll see this was done in multiple parts. I did a, sort of a, a quick break for lunch part way through, but uh, I'm going to bring up to about 16 times speed so you can watch the entire thing without actually uh, having to sit through, you know, several hours worth of actual uh, fleshing.
Now that we've finished doing the fleshing, we're going to be moving on to a washing part. I haven't completely finished fleshing. I still need to score that at a later date, but I like to do a quick wash here because I didn't do a pre-wash. What I'm going to be doing is trying to get most of that blood off, um, various bits of shit and stuff that are still stuck to the fur, and where possible, I'll be uh, taking off uh, various leaves and things like that, although uh, most of the time I'm fairly careless here. I just more will come back on and I'll take them off right at the end as required. So what we want to do here is get some moderately warm water. You can use cold water if you want, but moderately warm water will help you to properly clean off all the gunky bits and help dissolve them. If you make it too hot though, then uh, you'll reach a point where you'll start turning it into felt rather than wool. Now you want here one to two sort of scoops of just a general washing powder. I've, uh, I've recently started using something that's pH neutral and a little bit fancy schmancy from uh, some, some crazy hippies down the road, but uh, the stuff I'm using in this video is just your general run-of-the-mill washing powder, which I've kept off camera in order to uh, not do any brand recognition stuff. Now, you want to soak it for a couple of hours. You can do it overnight if you really want, but try not to leave it for too long because you can start to get bits of hair slip. This is uh, more alkali than acid and an alkaline environment will start to strip off the hair over time. Uh, you can do multiple washes as well. I'm just sort of giving it a general poke here with my my uh, my stirring stick. I use this for most of my stirring things where I don't want to get my hands dirty. And this stuff's pretty important to sort of go through and give it a general wash and really get that, that stuff uh, into it. Now, pick the camera up here and just give you a rough idea of what it looks like. You want everything to be fully contacted. You can see some leaves falling off the trees, mixing in. But uh, everything in there all nicely uh, dissolving. And you'd leave that to sit for, again, like I said, a couple of hours, uh, not too long. If you want to do multiple washes, uh, just wait until the water's dirty, stir it around, take it off, uh, maybe transfer it into another bucket or another container where you've pre-prepared some water. This will help to effectively clean everything off and leave you with a nice, beautiful skin. At this stage, what we're doing is scoring the membrane in the flesh here. What's important to do is to effectively peel back as much of that membrane as you can. Uh, if the membrane is particularly soft or if it's just not coming back, uh, nothing is really in an ideal world, uh, what you want to do is just sort of cross hatch it. I'm going to spend a bit of time here to actually try to peel the thing right back, um, but it just wasn't working for me. So uh, most of the time what I do is I just sort of score it. So I cross hatch, I could do that entire skin perhaps in, uh, in one to two minutes if I was just going to give up on the peeling the bit back. Uh, getting any additional bits of edge fat that I'd left. Ideally, this wouldn't be there. I would have done this earlier, but perhaps I missed it. I can't remember exactly. I may have been uh, slightly out of time, but this is the opportunity to do it. This is everything you want to do before we actually start tanning it. So you want to have the best possible skin uh, preparation before we go any further here. So crosshatch that, get it all done, and we'll move on to the tanning solution in the next step. So for this part, we're actually going to be creating the tanning solution itself. Very, this is the most important part. This is really what's going to be turning us, turning it from a skin into the leather at the, uh, the final sort of step. So what we're going to be doing in this segment here is measuring out the water, salt, and alum that we will require. Now, I already know exactly how much I'm going to be using, and I'm measuring it on camera here. But uh, what you want to do for yourself will be to uh, place the skin in whatever container you're using and add water to it until it is fully covered the skin completely. You want to be able to press that skin down and have every single square inch of that completely covered with the solution at the end. So uh, I'll be using 20 liters of water here or five gallons, probably a little bit too much, but it's, uh, it made an easy sort of a, a ratio for me to actually write down here. So uh, normally, typically when I do this, I have these five liters or about 1.25 gallon jugs that I use to just pour in. I know exactly how much I need, but for the purposes of sort of demonstration, I'm uh, filling up one liter on a little line drawn on that bottle, filling up one liter each time and pouring it in for 20 liters or five gallons. Next, we're going to be adding in uh, five kilos of a regular, completely non-iodized salt. Now, again, five kilograms works in pretty well here with me. So each gallon of water or each four liters of water basically makes one kilogram of uh, non-iodized salt. This is just a, a fine salt I picked up down at the local uh, brewing shop, but you can uh, use anything that you have as long as it's sort of uh, no iodized and no other additional additives to it. 
Okay, next step here is to measure out the alum itself. Now, the alum, you're using about 100 grams or 3.5 ounces for those Americans out there per gallon of water. Uh, you've got to make sure, that, again, it's enough water to completely cover the skin. So make sure you've measured out how much you put in. Pretty much only effective, uh, um, important the first time. After that, you should know how much your container will hold to cover one skin. You'll probably see the little puppy dog in the background limping. Uh, earlier that day, she'd actually been hit by a car, of all things. But uh, by the time of recording and posting this, she's fully healed up. Now, do keep in mind that the alum is a very major irritant. So keep it away from your skin. Try not to touch that. And definitely don't let your dogs or cats or anything sniff it and breathe it in. Eyes and lungs are the most vulnerable. So uh, it's not horrifically toxic, but it really not something that you want to have uh, touching you. Next up, we're going to want to use a stirring rod to sort of make sure that's completely dissolved. The alum, as I was just saying, is an irritant, so not something you want to touch your skin. Uh, you can could probably go the route of rubber gloves. I sometimes use the rubber gloves when pulling them in and out of the uh, storage thing, but I find just my stirring rod is the most efficient and easiest way to do it. When actually putting this stuff in there, make sure that it is fully covered. We don't want any air bubbles. We don't want any little pockets under there where that liquid is not actually touching the skin. Uh, wool's particularly good in that when it soaks up the water, it'll get very heavy and start to sink. But that initial part really does take a little bit of effort to make sure that it gets fully wet. Give it a good stir around and uh, stick it right down. When we stick it in here, we're going to leave it in here for about one week. Seven to ten days is the, uh, is the recommendation. You want to have it a, uh, a minimum of one week. A little bit longer, really, it won't be bad. I'm going to come back and give it a good stir like this every, uh, probably every every 12 hours or so. You could do it twice a day minimum. If you want to do, you could do a little bit more if you're really keen. But uh, effectively what you're doing is making sure that there's no little bits where the skin's touching, uh, touching itself and not allowing the liquid to come in and get to it. Uh, additional, you can add additional alum if you want. I was fairly skimpy with the alum because the stuff I'm using is very particularly high grade alum. I'm using stuff that you use to really dye um, uh, clothing and whatnot as opposed to some rough industrial grade alum. So I was quite uh, careful measuring it out. You can uh, add a little bit extra, it won't be bad, but, but typically that uh, 3.5 ounces or 100 grams per four liters or per gallon of water. Uh, pick, pick whichever measurements suit you in whatever part of the world you are. But uh, either way, that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to add that stuff in, give it a stir twice a day. Morning and evening is, is the easiest way to do it. And, uh, and leave it in there for a little while. Okay, it's been seven days here. I could leave it up to 10 if I was really keen, but uh, seven days is sufficient for this skin. Uh, time to give it a proper rinse out. I'm going to peer, if I pour this right out here. I'm going to try and keep this from picking up more dirt on the ground, but I uh, didn't do a particularly good job there. Uh, when I'm pouring it out, I really want to get uh, these things are really heavy as well. They soak up a lot of uh, a lot of moisture. A, a typical skin, that's a typical lamb skin. You'd want to be f uh, fewer than five centimeters long for that wool. I've got some very very long wool here, and uh, it gives it a, a shit ton of weight because it's holding all that water. Now you want to be putting it on uh, on some dry ground that doesn't have your beautiful favorite grass because it will be killing off anything that you're pouring it on top of and give it a good proper rinse here. We want to really get this all out. Uh, I decide to give it an extra um, a wash, get some washing powder and throw that in just because I wasn't hugely impressed with the uh, cleanliness. There's a little bit of blood and shit still left on it. So I needed to get that washed off. Um, you do not want to soak it. It will, uh, it will start to revert the tanning process. So ideally this would have done beforehand. I would have been a little bit more diligent cleaning it up the first time, but uh, getting that all done and rinsing it thoroughly right out. We want to get all that solution, all that tanning solution rinsed out of it. We want to get any kind of uh, washing powder, in this case completely rinsed and washed out and uh, left to sort of dry a little bit to uh, reduce that weight so I can carry it off to the proper drying rack later. But we're going to just squeeze it out. When you're, uh, when you're trying to dry, and never, never twist, always squeeze as they are. So uh, be careful here, you can rip off all the hair, but just keep squeezing it out and it will be ready to move on to the next part. Now immediately after pulling it out and rinsing off from the solution, we're going to hang it out to dry for a little bit. I've got a little wool rack here that I use for sorting wool as required, but you can use anything. It could be something as simple as a, uh, a couple of chairs with a 
with a stick or a piece of timber across it. Just use anything you want to keep it drying and uh, keep it away from the weather where possible. Now, uh, you're going to want to leave this here for about one hour. Uh, don't let it fully dry and just keep the wool side facing down at this point. We're going to be getting into it. We really want that uh, surface side to uh, get all the immediate bits of water off. We'll be coming back to that shortly and uh, preparing for the next step. So it's been an hour now and uh, pulling it out to start the next process. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to give it a quick brush here. I'm using a clean dog brush, uh, but you can use whatever you've got, a hairbrush, anything really. This has uh, a couple of different sides to it for, for different sets of uh, how fine I want to brush it. But I'm going to go through, I'm going to untangle any knots, remove leaves, etc. Uh, you typically wouldn't want to tan lambskin, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, that's, that's really got wool longer than say five centimeters or two inches uh, due to the fact that it tangles and it's also really, really heavy. It's a lot of work actually lifting uh, and, and moving a, a lambskin with this much wool on it. Um, in this case, I really quite like that plush look. So I was really willing to go to, you know, go the extra mile and, and do the extra work. Uh, the longer hair is more likely to have bits and pieces stuck in it. I said uh, the, um, early on there was a, a bit of blackberry stuck in there and that was uh, spiking me quite a lot of it, but I uh, managed to get it out. Um, you know, things like that are, are a bit of an issue as you go through it, but you should be able to get that all out at about this stage. This is where most of the final cleaning will be done. Now you will notice some of the hair will come out. This is not really an issue unless, you, unless you're getting like really big chunks coming out of one spot. If you are getting a lot of slippage, uh, it's probably worthwhile to make up a bit more tanning solution and put it in for another uh, couple of days, but uh, I'm not getting anything major here so I'm not too worried about it this is uh, this was a good amount of time it was in there uh, if you are going to do it now is probably the last chance to really properly cut and shape your skin uh, as I'm saying I've gone for a more natural look with this particular skin but it is really purely down to taste and how you want to actually do it yourself now that this stuff is all cleaned up we're going to be applying a bunch of egg yolks we're not including the whites the whites here now, this particular mixture I've got in front of me is four egg yolks mixed with about half a litre of water, which is about uh, 17 fluid ounces for you Americans. Now, we're going to smear this in and we're going to be really generous with, with it. We're going to cover every part of the underside. And it's important to do this while it's still wet or damp from, uh, from the tanning bath. We don't want to let this dry too much before we start rubbing this stuff in. Uh, once it's all done, it's pretty much time to get this baby back up onto the drying rack for a few days, skin side facing up again. I'm going to try to minimize the folds of the skin to ensure sort of an even drying speed. It's not really critical, but I uh, want it to dry sort of relatively even. Now, I'm going to make sure we check it every few day, every day for heading into the next step. But uh, we'll hang that baby up and uh, we'll leave it at that. So it's been a few days and the skin now is starting to get fairly dry, it's still a little bit moist. Um, but we are ready to move on to the next step. It's still a little bit cool to the touch. So you can see here there's a couple of lumps and bumps and, and rough bits, uh, mostly because we scored the membrane rather than fully removing it. Um, it's it, a little bit unsightly now, but it's not an issue. This will actually be taken care of later, so nothing to really be concerned about. So the actual next step that we're going to be doing is in is actually stretching the skin. So we're going to be grabbing it, get, get a, good goal, a good solid grip of the skin, not the wool, Good solid grip of the skin and give it a good pull. You're going to be fairly firm here. You don't want to be too uh, too little weak and, and, and give it a little tug and, and do nothing at all. We're actually trying to stretch and break the fibers that the tanning process is sort of solidified and tied up. You can see there's a, a whiter patch followed by a little bit of a darker patch up top where I haven't yet uh, stretched. You can see the, the difference is quite, quite obvious. There is quite a large difference there. So you want to give it a, a good stretch and you will see it start to lighten up almost immediately. We're going to be doing this to the entire skin. Now you can be you can be fairly strong with this as it is important that there is a, an actual real stretch, but you want to be careful on the edges though as pulling the wrong way can really tear it, especially where it's a little bit thinner on the edges there. If you do notice the skin is not actually going white, uh, then you really need to simply leave it to dry for a bit longer. Um, I'm going to go through this and, and sort of give it a, a full stretch all the way through. Uh, you can see a few cuts and, and tears there where I was a little bit rough on the the fleshing process but you give a good there you go good stretch right that and um, it goes a hell of a lot lighter colored so I'm going to go through and do the entire thing like that you're going to come back and do this probably once maybe twice a day if you're really keen until the thing is completely dry 
Uh, so I don't need to get a 100% job the first time. I'm going to go through it and really put a bit of effort in. Uh, the other thing to do is, as you can see by the inset image here, uh, you can use a rounded piece of hardwood or something to stretch and pull the skin to really help break up those fibers. A um, bit of a, a rub as well helps to sort of get rid of uh, some of the, the, the tension in there. And the more you work it over, the softer the final skin will be. So it's important to spend a bit of time here. It's, it's not a particularly fun part of the job. It does take a, a little bit of muscle if your skin is quite firm. Um, and it's not a hugely thankless, it's a bit of a thankless job at this point. But when you're done, you will, uh, you'll appreciate the extra effort and work that's been put into it. As a, as a skin will be a hell of a lot softer and uh, won't require sort of all that working over at the end. For the really, I guess, in the sort of industrial setup, for some of us, uh, you can get an old uh, an old dryer, something you're not going to use. Uh, probably don't use your, your home dryer because your home tumble dryer because that will sort of put the smell of skin all the way through it, and it may kind of ruin it. You, you, you know, significant other may not be hugely impressed with that. But if you're particularly keen, you can actually put this in a uh, a tumble dryer with no heat and give it a couple of hours just tumbling around, and that will actually break up the fibers as well and give it a really nice good stretch. But you'll do that when uh, the thing is almost fully dry. That still means you want to spend a little bit of time here stretching it while it's in its sort of the final phases of drying. But uh, we'll give, keep giving it a good tug and uh, we'll move on to the final step after this. Now the final step here is just to finish it off. I'll be sanding the skin back with some fine sandpaper. Skin in this particular case is about 95% dry. Ideally you'd probably wait until it's about 100% dry, but I had to get this one filmed early. Uh, it doesn't make much of a material difference to the end product, but it might have been a little bit easier for me if it actually waited. Now, there's potentially a long and boring process, but it's really important to be quite thorough here. The more, inten more attention here that, uh, that I give to it, uh, then the better the final product will actually be. Uh, and this really is the chance for me to go back and sand all those rough knobbly bits. I do recommend that you use some form of gloves here. I, uh, I didn't, uh, and I was paying the price for the next couple of days really did sort of grind my finger skin on the edges down to uh, right down to the proper calluses, which can be a little bit uncomfortable. But uh, also highly recommend, you know, I'm not doing it here, which is uh, is poor, I guess, demonstration, but uh, wear some PPE, wear a, a proper a ma a dusk mask here. This really will clog up your lungs for the next day. Uh, there's probably little bits of aluminium and stuff still soaked into it, so I don't think it's particularly healthy for me. Uh, but I was really too focused on the video to sort of remember to wear the proper PPE. And so I was sort of regretting it for the next few days as I was coughing out the various chunks of lambskin. You can sort of see I'm halfway through it now, and uh, it's making quite a quite a significant difference there. Um, these sort of scraggly, messy bits are gone, and it's replaced with sort of a nice, smooth leather. Uh, now this can be exhausting work, but being thorough will result in a superior product here. Uh, where possible, make sure to find a comfortable place to sit or stand when doing this. I was constrained by where I could effectively film, but you guys can do it wherever and however you please. When it's all done at the end, give it a bit of a shake. Uh, this job here was a first pass. Um, it ended up taking more than half an hour in actually uh, filming and and, uh, and and getting it all done in one go. So uh, in the interest of sort of keeping it all together for YouTube, I uh, did a bit of a rough job. But uh, I'll go through a second time afterwards off camera and give it a really good proper second go and smooth out any of those rough bits. But other than that, we've got ourselves a finished product. So um, I'm going to throw up some, some pictures, probably have a couple all the way through this of, of the finished product and how it's all going. But that is a lambskin. That is how to tan it from woe to go. Uh, there was a separate video earlier of how to actually salt it for, for storage and early preparation. But uh, this entire video will take, if you've got a fresh lambskin or if you've got one that's been salted or just come out of the freezer, this will show you, this entire video will show you how to tan the thing um, all the way through. If you've got any questions, drop a comment down. I'm more than happy to, to explain what to do. Um, try and help you find some of the chemicals and whatnot if you are struggling. They are fairly common off the shelf or from your local ag and rural supply shop. So nothing um, spectacularly difficult to get. And uh, failing that, in the modern world, you can always order things online very easily for the most part. But uh, good luck with your own lambskins out there. And, and this sort of technique should apply to any kind of skin out there. Uh, if you can't do it with uh, with anything, that, then let me know. But I'm, I'm fairly confident that any sort of skin uh, will work with this sort of technique. Well, take care, guys, and I'll see you next time.